The story of neoliberalism is a story about the power of ideas. Our world, and we who live in it, are at every moment of our histories being guided and directed by ideas which we might or might not consciously recognize. We rely on our upbringings, our educations, our experiences, and our collaborations with each other to create a version of reality that seems cohesive and meaningful to us. But inevitably, our conceptions of the world become colored by the dominant organizing principles of society, whether we perceive them or not. Thankfully, as time goes on, even our most closely held beliefs about what the world is and how the world should be change. At the conclusion of World War II, the ideas which dominated social, political, and economic life were those that pursued global peace, stability, and compromise between social classes within a capitalist society. These ideas were born out of titanic struggles against economic depressions and vicious fascist regimes, which proved incontrovertibly that the ideas which previously ruled the world had guided it frighteningly astray. There was an overwhelming cry for a new set of ideas to guide the world, ideas that focused on achieving human flourishing through the tactful use of government intervention in the economy. John Maynard Keynes was the primary author responsible for bringing these new ideas into the world. His general theory smashed the laissez-faire consensus of classical liberalism by demonstrating the power that active governments had in protecting people from the dangers of severe depressions, and even from global conflicts that were born from economic chaos. But beyond his theories themselves, Keynes lifted the already vital importance of sound economic policy to dizzying new heights. Regardless of what economic policies one believed were the correct ones, it was evident to all that economic ideas were now the realm in which true power over the course of history resided. Embedded liberalism was not the first global economic paradigm to assume this power over world events, but the shift to embedded liberalism marked one of the most deliberate and dramatic global transitions in human history. The unquestionable logic of self-regulating capitalist markets under classical liberalism had been subordinated to a compromise between the ambitions of capital and the security of laborers. People expected their governments to protect them from hunger, disease, impoverishment, and squalor, even if it meant intervening in the market's ability to generate profit. For much of the world, it was an enormous victory for humanistic ideals of liberty, justice, and equity that had been gaining ground since the Enlightenment. But for some others, it was an insufferable defeat that would not go unanswered. Embedded liberalism was in power, but it was not without resistance. Thinkers and economists loyal to classical liberalism and laissez-faire capitalism had been politically refuted. Their worldviews had been confounded by the Great Depression, and they now had to reconcile their lives' works with their stunning rebuke by Keynes. Meanwhile, the agents of business and capital, including the American opponents of the New Deal and British opponents of Clement Attlee's British reforms, were only begrudgingly accepting of the situation at best or on the warpath against intervention at worst. These two factions saw only danger and incompetence in the ideas of those like Keynes, who would empower governments to stifle private individuals and companies from realizing their economic potential, and imbue them with totalitarian ambitions of planning all aspects of society. But rather than help refine embedded liberalism to achieve a better balance between regulation and competition, these two factions allied with one another to create an idea so powerful it would covertly undo their losses to embedded liberalism by supplanting it entirely. But before we excavate the prehistory of neoliberalism, it's important to recognize the crucial fact that neoliberalism was different at its origin than it is today. It morphed through intellectual and political phases over time, sometimes deliberately, and sometimes by unconsciously conforming to the available political landscape. There are, in fact, four distinct phases of neoliberalism, all of which will be covered by this series. The first phase of neoliberalism took place in Europe between 1918 and 1950. The conclusion of the First World War was the moment that classical liberals were forced to concede that there existed pernicious instability within laissez-faire market societies. The Great Depression of 1929 was the second blow to classical liberalism, and created a crisis of market legitimacy that necessitated liberalism's rehabilitation. Owing to Keynes's general theory, Early neoliberal thinkers reformulated classical liberalism by acknowledging the need for a strong state. But there was a less than monolithic consensus about what exactly this new liberalism would be. Early divergences occurred within new liberal thought and actually produced different strains of neoliberalism, such as the German ordo liberalism, which valued social welfare and anti monopoly regulation highly, and the more libertarian variant of neoliberalism originating with the Austrian School of Economics which stressed the preservation of a competitive order through the rule of law. Over time, however, a coalition of neoliberal thinkers from Austria, France, Germany, England, and America 
coalesced around the goals of protecting individualism and free market competition from what they perceived to be different shades of dangerous collectivism spreading over the world. Neoliberalism targeted an incredibly broad spectrum of enemies, ranging from moderate Keynesian liberals and progressive reformers to socialists, Marxists, and communist Bolsheviks, all of whom, they believed, would invariably deliver the world to totalitarianism. This period was capped by the creation of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, a closed debating society organized by Friedrich Hayek, which convened its very first meeting on this day, April 1st, 72 years ago. The Mont Pelerin Society laid the groundwork for a highly organized and well-financed front against all forms of government intervention, but especially Keynesian embedded liberalism. Keynes's death in 1946 and the fervent anti-communist air of the Cold War provided fertile ground for neoliberalism to grow in the shadow of embedded liberalism. The second phase of neoliberalism took place in America and Europe between 1950 and 1980. This phase was marked by several developments in neoliberal thought and organization. Close partnership between neoliberal academics and wealthy corporate backers enabled potent neoliberal ideas to emanate from prestigious university economics departments, especially in Chicago. These same corporate backers also weaponized a new political institution, dubbed the Think Tank, which pushed the research produced by these neoliberal economists and supplemented it with mountains of their own neoliberal policies and critiques from outside of academia that were intended for use by journalists and politicians. It was also during this era that neoliberalism shed all of the few social elements contained in its earlier forms, including anti-monopoly regulation and social safety nets, in favor of treating corporate monopolies as benign, seeking deregulation of all government functions and private industries, and relentlessly eroding the power of labor unions. This newer, more aggressive strain of neoliberalism was laser-focused on accumulating intellectual and scientific legitimacy, which provided cover for its frequent collaborations with right-wing dictators, especially in Latin America. This era included the creation of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1968, a prize that was conceived for the express purpose of raising the profile of neoliberal economics. It also included the Pinochet coup in Chile in 1973, a CIA-backed coup aided by neoliberal Chilean economists trained by Mont Pelerin members. This era culminated in the global stagflation crisis of the 1970s, which provided the opening for neoliberalism to crack the Keynesian consensus and propel Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to victory. The third phase of neoliberalism constitutes the actual neoliberal revolution, which took place all over the world between 1980 and 2008. Thatcher and Reagan each aggressively initiated neoliberal policies in the US and the UK, and then globally through the conversions of the post-war institutions, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, into neoliberal organizations that spread neoliberalism through the structural adjustment policies imposed on financially struggling countries. It was during this era that the accomplishments of embedded liberalism began to be stripped away. The rates of unemployment, poverty, productivity, corporate profits, wealth inequality, incarceration, and military spending began to climb, while tax rates for the top income tax bracket were slashed, and wages for everyday people began to stagnate. The Bretton Woods international monetary system eventually collapsed, creating the possibility for rapid financial globalization across national borders to occur. It was also during this phase that neoliberalism not only spread over the world, but took on idiosyncratic attributes of its home countries. At first, American neoliberalism fused neoliberal antipathy towards regulation, welfare, unions, and taxes with the radical evangelical Christian cultural politics found in the conservative Republican Party, which campaigned against non-white immigration, abortion, gun laws, gay marriage, and the teaching of evolution in public schools. Tragically, the crushing defeats that liberal parties suffered in the US and the UK at the hands of Thatcher and Reagan influenced them to walk away from their accomplishments under embedded liberalism and adopt neoliberalism instead. Rather than recommit to the ideas that made liberal parties the architects of the great 20th century prosperity, new Democrats such as Bill Clinton began to triangulate between what they perceived to be the positions of their centrist Democratic base and a radically right-wing Republican base, with the intention being the recapture of a wide swath of the voting population for Democrats. But this only resulted in a distinct shift of the Overton window to the right. Contrasting with the Republican brand, the Democratic brand of neoliberalism combined the same blind faith in the virtues of markets with reverence for technocracy, meritocracy, elite education, and professional expertise. This made them easy marks for an ideology obsessed with accumulating status and prestige, and induced them to abandon their historic working-class voter base in pursuit of a mythical professional-class voter who was seeking a midpoint between Republican madness and muddled liberal corporatism. Democrats would provide the counterbalance on social issues like gay marriage and abortion, 
but would reliably fold when presented with opportunities to oppose deregulation, wealth concentration, and military adventurism. The same thing happened in the UK, where the new Labour Party under Tony Blair entrenched and extended the accomplishments of the Thatcherite Conservative Party. The cumulative result of this era was a sleepwalking descent into ubiquitous political and economic misdirection. The United States now had two major political parties that battled fiercely within the narrow space permitted by neoliberal market perspectives, whose traditional labels of liberal and conservative no longer had any meaning. The American public ironically became increasingly partisan in a time when both parties had seemingly developed two styles of the same political ideology, which isolated any who called for government intervention in the economy and especially the dismantling of dangerous concentrations of wealth and power. The fourth phase of neoliberalism extends from the 2008 global financial crisis until today. In 2008, the consequences of decades of neoliberal hegemony were made stark and apparent to the entire globe. Market forces had once again devastated the world economy through reckless corporate activity, just as in the Wall Street crash in the Great Depression. But this time, there was no transition to a new economic paradigm. This is mostly because of the failures of President Barack Obama, and the enduring influence of neoliberalism in the Democratic Party. When President Obama took office in 2009, he had the strongest mandate to completely realign politics towards a new economic system that any president had enjoyed since Ronald Reagan. He could have begun the slow but necessary transition away from the neoliberalism that had characterized the previous three decades, but squandered that opportunity almost entirely. Of course, it would be remiss not to mention that Obama was standing in opposition to the Republicans, a group so virulently neoliberal and anti-intellectual that they can claim most of America's political deterioration for themselves. Nevertheless, the remedies to the crisis that were approved by Obama included only stimulus packages that were insufficient to undo the harm experienced by the public and did not include punishment for the corporate recklessness that obviously induced the crisis. The major perpetrators walked away virtually unscathed and billions of dollars richer. Neoliberalism was permitted to live on as a zombie paradigm, with its corruption and lawlessness made plain for all to see. The mirage of stability and recovery that the world experienced under Obama only served to mask the economic precarity under which the average citizen of the developed world was now living, and was a fitting prelude to the violent but predictable lurch to authoritarianism under Trump, who is both fascist and neoliberal. Trump expertly harnessed the disgust born from neoliberal decay by positioning himself outside of the political establishment but in fascist style, scapegoated immigrants, all while providing an easy entrance for the most sadistic neoliberal forces in the country to further dominate the government. The Democrats could have capitalized on this populist moment themselves by returning to their legacy as the defenders of labor from capital and savagely attacking their opponent's neoliberal agenda. But instead, they blundered by nominating an arch-neoliberal, who was indelibly stained with the image of a dismal manager of the status quo. Against a populist authoritarian, she was a dead candidate walking. The Democrats, therefore, continued a long trend of losing to increasingly dangerous Republican neoliberals by refusing to reject their own weaker brand of neoliberalism. In the same way that liberals post-Reagan conceded political ground to the right, they continue to do so today by clinging to their faith in neoliberalism to deliver electoral success and by refusing to embrace their left flank. We now turn to the first phase of neoliberalism, the phase from 1918 to 1950, in which free market capitalist thinkers were compelled to devise a new liberalism that overcame the pitfalls of the Great Depression and fought back against the powerful ideas of Keynesian liberals and socialist central planning theorists. Friedrich Hayek became the grandfather of the global neoliberal movement and ignited the greatest intellectual counter-revolution in modern history. Neoliberalism's gradual ascent and then complete takeover of society is a complex, sordid, and in many ways ironic story. But most importantly, it was far from inevitable and it's a story that needs to be told if we're to deeply understand the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. Though Hayek spent much of the 20th century in Keynes' shadow, the world would one day live in Hayek's shadow, and no one had any idea what was coming. This is where the story of neoliberalism begins. Friedrich August von Hayek was born in Vienna, in what was then known as Austria-Hungary in 1889. Hayek was born into a wealthy family of high academic achievement, Hayek's father, August von Hayek, was a medical doctor who worked for the Viennese Municipal Ministry of Health and was a part-time lecturer on botany at the University of Vienna. Hayek's mother, Felicitas von Jurashek, was born into a wealthy conservative and landowning family, and before Hayek was born, received a vast inheritance in the early years of her marriage to Hayek's father. Both of Hayek's grandfathers, Franz von Jurashek and Gustav Edler von Hayek, were scholars and lecturers as well. 
Jaroszek was a leading economist in Austria and close friend of Eugene von Bumba Werk, one of the foundational thinkers of the Austrian School of Economics. Gustav Edler taught natural science in Vienna for 30 years and wrote many works on biology. Hayek was also second cousin to the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. From an early age, Hayek was a precocious child surrounded by intellectual stimulation. He read philosophical works fluently before attending school. He was the oldest of three, with two younger brothers, but preferred to associate with adults. Hayek was deeply influenced by his father, who frequently suggested large volumes for him to read, and also piqued his interest in biology. Hayek spent many hours practicing botany with his father, and traveled extensively throughout Europe collecting natural specimens of plants, minerals, and insects. Hayek's preoccupation with botany also exposed him to Darwinian evolutionary theory from a young age. The ideas of survival of the fittest and of spontaneous evolutionary development were profoundly influential on his economic theories later in life. In 1917, Hayek enlisted in the Austro-Hungarian army and fought on the Italian front during World War I. He experienced combat as a telephone officer and as a spotter in military aircraft. It was actually during his military service that he was given his first books and pamphlets on economics by a fellow officer. He was especially influenced by the works of Walter Rathenau, who was actually a socialist planner. After suffering damage to his hearing in his left ear, he was decorated for bravery and discharged after a year of service in 1918. After leaving the army, he enrolled as a student at the University of Vienna, where his father had lectured. His experience in the war left him with ambitions of helping work towards a better world by becoming a university professor. As Hayek began his university studies, the world around him changed dramatically. The Hamburg dynasty of Austria-Hungary was no more, and was replaced by the new Republic of Austria, which only consisted of a small fraction of its previous population and territory. The Romanovs in Russia were executed, and the Soviet Union, along with eight other new states, came into existence. New borders crisscrossed all over the European continent. The free market gold standard system of international trade, on which classical liberalism flourished prior to World War I, was put on life support. In post-war Vienna, Marxism, common ownership of the means of production, welfare statism, and the planned economy achieved a sudden academic respectability, just as inflation had reached levels that no living European could remember. All of this only fueled Hayek's interest in economics, and brought his attention to the question which would concern him for the rest of his life. Was this socialist reform that was sprouting up all around him actually feasible? Though Hayek began his lifelong fascination with economics by reading socialist planning literature, the decisive influence for Hayek finally came from the liberal free market economic tradition of the Austrian School of Economics, located at the University of Vienna. A prestigious lineage of economic mentors and pupils, including Karl Menger, Eugen von Bumba Werk, Friedrich von Wieser, and Ludwig von Mises, were Hayek's formative influences. Menger was the teacher of both Bumba Werk and Wieser, while Mises was subsequently a student of Bumba Werk. Hayek would learn from all four of these elder Austrian economists in different capacities throughout his life. Karl Menger is considered the most original thinker of the Austrian school of economics. Both Hayek and Mises, who are today themselves considered giants of the Austrian school, credit Karl Menger with almost single-handedly opening a new era in the history of economic thought with his book Principles of Economics, published in 1871. Hayek considered one of Menger's greatest contributions in principles to be his individualist or subjectivist approach, which located the focus of all economic activity in the actions, decisions, values, and knowledge of individuals. In 1883, Menger published another work, entitled Investigations into the Methods of the Social Sciences, with special reference to economics. In this work, Menger posed a question which Hayek considered one of the most pressing questions facing economics, if not all of the social sciences, which was, how can institutions which serve the common welfare emerge without a common will aiming at their creation? Menger insisted that it was an error to reduce all institutions to acts of positive common will, and that institutions were in fact unintended creations. Menger wrote, Natural organisms almost without exception exhibit, when closely observed, a really admirable functionality of all parts with respect to the whole, a functionality which is not, however, the result of human calculation, but of a natural process. Similarly, we can observe in numerous social institutions a strikingly apparent functionality with respect to the whole, but with closer consideration, they still do not prove to be the result of an intention aimed at this purpose, i.e. the result of an agreement of members of society. They, too, present themselves rather as natural products. Hayek derived an important insight from Menger's work. 
At a time when the socialists and Marxists of the day were insisting that economies needed to be deliberately planned and coordinated to achieve both prosperity and a just distribution of resources, Manger hinted that institutions like the government and the economy were simply not the result of coordination, but rather of a spontaneously generated sum of decisions by disconnected individuals acting in concert, which Hayek later likened to an unconscious process of evolution. The next two great influences on Hayek were Wieser and Bumba Werk who were both students and colleagues of Menger at the University of Vienna. These two men were brothers-in-law and lifelong friends, and Bumba Werk, as we recall, was also a close friend of Hayek's maternal grandfather, Franz von Jeraschek. Bumba Werk was a steadfast adherent of Menger, and was the most well-known Austrian economist of the time thanks to his long career as a leading Austrian statesman. Bumba Werk's face actually appeared on the 100-shilling banknote from 1984 until the euro was introduced in 2002. Bumba Werk is notable for his early and explicit conflicts with Marxist economic thought. Each of Bumba Werk's major economic works included criticisms of Marx, including Marx's exploitation theory and Marx's theory of labor value. Bumba Werk and his successors' early skirmishes with Marxism established the Austrian school as a persistent adversary of socialism. Wieser, on the other hand, was a more unique figure in the Austrian school. Hayek mainly studied under Wieser and gravitated to many of Wieser's novel economic ideas. Wieser was both Hayek's professor and his thesis advisor for the majority of Hayek's time as a student in Vienna, but Wieser was just as large of a figure in the field of sociology as he was in economics, and his sociological training lent his ideas more sympathy to government intervention than Menger or certainly Bumba Werk. Wieser was a follower of the Fabian Society, a society of British socialists that included figures such as Beatrice and Sidney Webb, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Harold Lasky, and even the two major protagonists of British embedded liberalism, William Beveridge and Clement Attlee. As a student, Hayek was a disciple of Wieser, and mostly sympathetic to the idea of government involvement in the economy. Hayek recalled later in life that when he was a student, he was very much aware that there were two traditions in the Austrian school, the Bumba Werk tradition and the Wieser tradition. However, he added that Wieser was tainted with Fabian socialist sympathies. Hayek's last major influence, Ludwig von Mises, was, according to Hayek, his chief guide among all of his influences, and was most certainly a follower of the Bumba Werk tradition. Mises is the most important of all of Hayek's influences for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was Mises who first shook Hayek's faith in government intervention with his book, Socialism, published in 1922. It was this work that shifted the trajectory of Hayek's thought away from the democratic socialism of Wieser and into the camp of the anti-socialist Bumba Werk Austrians. In the early 1920s, Mises initiated what became known as the Socialist Calculation Debate, which was a theoretical assault on the practicality of a centrally planned economy. In his article from 1920, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, Mises argued that socialism could not rationally allocate resources in society due to the absence of market prices under a system of central planning. According to Mises, the absence of an exchange economy with private property, a competitive market, contract, and profit would mean that there would be no such thing as price, and therefore economic decision-making, both on the individual and governmental level, would be impossible. Mises's broadside then earned responses from prominent socialist thinkers of the time, such as Oscar Longa. Mises later extended these arguments in his book, Socialism, which Hayek said dashed his hopes that socialism would ever deliver a more rational, just world. Secondly, Mises was a crucial mentor and ally for Hayek early in his career and for the rest of his life. Shortly after Hayek's graduation in 1923, Mises hired Hayek as a specialist for the Austrian government on the recommendation of Hayek's former mentor, Wieser. In 1924, Hayek was hired to work as a research assistant for the American professor Jeremiah Jenks at New York University, who Mises introduced Hayek to and who hired Hayek based on Mises's recommendation. After returning from New York, Hayek became a consistent attendee of Mises's Privat Seminar, an informal evening seminar devoted to discussion of high-level concepts in various fields of the social sciences. In 1927, Mises founded an economic research center in Austria on Hayek's advice, called the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research, and then hired Hayek as its first director. At every step of Hayek's early career, Mises was there, providing Hayek opportunities to build his professional experience and eventually make his entrance into academia. In 1929, the same year as the Wall Street crash and the advent of the Great Depression, Hayek became a Privat Dozen, or an unpaid lecturer, at the University of Vienna, where he previously studied. It was at this point in history that laissez-faire liberalism had arrived at its lowest point, 
and even self-identified classical liberals were beginning to understand that their economic and political vision was in serious need of rethinking. Though Hayek had finally gotten his foot in the door of academia, his time at the University of Vienna was short. Political conditions across the European continent were beginning to darken, as the Nazis began consolidating power in interwar Germany. Mises confided to Hayek and his other colleagues that he believed freedom in Austria would soon end. Thankfully for Hayek, his work would find the attention of sympathetic liberal economists at the London School of Economics, which would prove to be the stage for Hayek's true entrance into the world of academia. In 1931, the London School of Economics and Political Science, or LSE for short, was a leading institution of higher learning with a storied history known around the world. The school was founded in 1895 by Beatrice and Sidney Webb of the Fabian Society, the same socialist society that earned the respect of Hayek's early mentor, Friedrich Wieser. However, the school's Fabian roots didn't produce a singularly socialist or leftist institution. The LSE's influence across the range of economic thought was extensive. The LSE incubated the highly influential socialism of Harold Lasky, the post-war embedded liberalism of Beveridge and Attlee, and a revival of classical liberalism under Edward Cannon and Lionel Robbins simultaneously. It was this last faction of classical liberal holdouts, headed by Cannon and later Robbins, that would bring Hayek to London and help him make a name for himself. Hayek had previously made contact with Edwin Cannon through his work for the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research. Hayek recalled that Mises considered Cannon a kindred spirit, and Hayek was effusive in his praise for Cannon, who he said, safeguarded the main body of liberal thought through that eclipse in the intellectual history of liberalism, which lasted throughout the 15 or 20 years following the First World War. Cannon was a classical liberal in the tradition of Adam Smith, who placed emphasis on the slow transformation of communities. Cannon wrote, All important change is gradual, and social institutions are not created by the sudden efforts of inspired geniuses, but grow of themselves, usually slower than oak trees. It comes as no surprise that Cannon kept a portrait of Karl Manger hanging from the wall of his office at the LSE. Much like Hayek, Cannon was originally an ally of interventionists, but in the early 20th century, he moved sharply to the side of classical liberalism. Cannon was the main combatant in the long-standing rivalry between the economists of the LSE and those of Cambridge under the auspices of Alfred Marshall, the mentor of John Maynard Keynes. Marshall had been the most influential economist in Britain for many years. Marshall's major work, ironically also titled Principles of Economics, but published 19 years after Manger's book of the same name, was the dominant economic textbook in England for decades. Marshall was one of the first economists to start taking economics to a more mathematically rigorous level, and also began to move economics away from its classical focus on the market economy, and instead popularized it as a study of human behavior. Cannon and Marshall had deep disagreements over the usefulness of pure theory and of economic history within the field of economics as a whole. When Cannon finally stepped down as the head of economics at the LSE in 1927, the distinguished American economist Alan Young was meant to replace him. But when Young died suddenly of pneumonia in 1929, the path was open for another man to become head of economics at LSE at the bright young age of only 30 years old. That man was Lionel Robbins, who would go on to not only revitalize classical liberal economics at LSE, but bring Hayek on board the LSE's economics faculty, where he would do battle against Keynes, Cambridge, and interventionist economics. Before Hayek entered the scene, Robbins had already been battling against Keynes on the Committee of Economists appointed in 1930 by Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. The committee's task was to examine the origins of the Great Depression and recommend solutions. Keynes chaired the committee, leading to frequent clashes between Keynes and Robbins. In the end, Robbins refused to sign the final report, despite the fact that Keynes had originally recommended him for appointment to the committee in the first place. Robbins first heard of Hayek from an article Hayek had written entitled The Paradox of Saving, in which Hayek attacked the Keynesian notion that the British economy was suffering from excessive saving and not enough consumption. At a time when Keynesianism was rapidly gaining credibility, Robbins considered Hayek's article to be the thing that we need at the moment to fight Keynes. In January and February of 1931, Robbins invited Hayek to give four lectures at the LSE concerning the topics of his new book, Prices and Production. In contrast to an earlier lecture Hayek gave at Cambridge, which left the audience completely bewildered, the lectures at the LSE were extremely well received, and Hayek was quickly invited to become a professor at the LSE and to be featured in the LSE's scholarly journal, Economica. In May 1931, an English translation of The Paradox of Saving was published as the lead feature in Economica. The next issue, published in August, was a harshly critical review written by Hayek of Keynes's book, A Treatise on Money, and included an invitation for Keynes to respond in its closing paragraphs. This attack was the first that Keynes had ever heard of Hayek, 
and for Hayek to put himself on equal footing with Keynes was to raise his profile significantly. In the November edition, a devastating reply from Keynes and a second rebuttal from Hayek was published. In his response, Keynes called Hayek's prices and production one of the most frightful muddles I have ever read, with scarcely a sound proposition in it, and an extraordinary example of how, starting with a mistake, a remorseless logician can end up in bedlam. Hayek was just as unsparing in his follow-up reply, writing, Unfortunately, Mr. Keynes's answer does not seem to me to clear up many of the difficulties I have pointed out. He replies chiefly by a sweeping accusation of confusion. I cannot believe Mr. Keynes wished to give the impression that he is trying to distract the attention of the reader from the objections which have been raised by abusing his opponent. The next year, in February 1932, the second part of Hayek's review of A Treatise on Money was published. For almost an entire year, Hayek dominated the pages of Economica by sparring directly with the most popular economists of the day. The feud was made public in October 1932, when Keynes and several other Cambridge economists sent a letter to the London Times suggesting public investment to fight the Depression. In response, Robbins, Hayek, and other LSE economists fired back, supporting the government's balanced budget policy. The main question at stake was whether government or private interests would be better at growing the British economy. Hayek and Robbins, of course, argued it was private interests who were superior, but at the time, Keynesianism was winning public opinion. Still, Hayek's exposure in Economica and the debate in the pages of British newspapers established a place for Hayek in British academia. By this time, Hayek had come to be seen as Robbins' point man for intellectual combat with Cambridge. With their heightened notoriety, Robbins and Hayek launched a joint economic seminar led by the two of them together that would become enormously popular at the LSE in the early and mid-1930s. The economics department that Robbins and Hayek built together became, in Hayek's words, probably the most important center of the new liberalism. The LSE attracted visiting economists from all around the world, including fellow Austrians Gottfried Haberler and Fritz Matschlup from Vienna, and the Americans Frank Knight and Jacob Viner from Chicago. During his heyday at the LSE, Hayek began an intellectual transition from technical economic theory, which had been the primary focus of his career up until then, to broader fields of political philosophy. His first foray into this new mode of thought was a condensed collection of the socialist calculation debate begun by Mises a decade earlier, which he published as Collectivist Economic Planning in 1935. In the process of explaining the socialist calculation problem to an English-speaking audience, Hayek began to think harder about the methodologies of the social sciences that Manger and Cannon had been criticizing years ago. He was still seeking the answer to the question of how to create a society of order in which no one is actually coerced or directed by a central authority. No one knew it at the time, but Hayek was actually on the cusp of formulating one of the most powerful ideas of any academic field to ever be put to paper, the concept of spontaneous order in a competitive economy. In 1936, the same year as Keynes' own magnum opus, The General Theory, Hayek published a small article entitled Economics and Knowledge. In this work, Hayek articulated the million-dollar question that had dogged him for so many years. Hayek wrote, how can the combination of fragments of knowledge existing in different minds bring about results which, if they were to be brought about deliberately, would require a knowledge on the part of the directing mind which no single person can possess? To show that in this sense the spontaneous actions of individuals will, under conditions which we can define, bring about a distribution of resources which can be understood as if it were made according to a single plan, although nobody has planned it, seems to me indeed an answer to the problem which has sometimes been metaphorically described as that of the social mind. Though Hayek wouldn't pose the direct answer to this question until 1945 in another groundbreaking article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, he was beginning to perceive the whole of economics through a brand new light. Hayek realized that the price mechanism in a competitive market society was an incredibly powerful tool for spreading accurate information. Hayek's idea was that a free market economy was like an unconscious mind, that could synthesize and transmit information about price and value faster and more efficiently than any other economic system, but especially a centrally planned socialist economy. As long as there was a strong state to enforce laws in which rational, utility-maximizing individuals enjoyed the freedom to contribute their dispersed fragments of information to the market through buying and selling, liberty and prosperity would be maximized. The undirected free market would process more information than any central planning board could ever dream of, and any government intervention would only distort these price signals and disturb the otherwise perfect ecosystem of a free market society. Hayek had begun to explain how free market economies were not just places where commerce took place, they were the mechanisms that allowed the institutions of society to organize themselves without the coercion of a central authority. This was an accomplishment that built on and surpassed the theories of Manger, Cannon, and Mises, 
and Hayek posed his idea as the solution to the limits of human knowledge in a complex economy, and why economies that permitted government intervention literally could not deliver the goods. But the prominence that the LSE enjoyed earlier in the 1930s didn't last forever. By the end of the decade, almost all of those who had been in Hayek's camp had shifted to Keynes. The role of active governments in the management of recessions and depressions became accepted as a common fact. The New Deal policies in the United States were well underway. Keynesianism was about to reach the height of its influence over liberal democracy, while Hayek's audience had dispersed. The world was passing over Hayek and his grand idea, an idea that would one day return to rule the world. Classical liberalism, laissez-faire capitalism, and the global gold standard trading system were now in political freefall. The ideas of government intervention in the economy, whether Keynesian or Marxist, were spreading and finding support all over the world. For those opposed to such policies, these were lonely times indeed, and the thinkers and business leaders who remained loyal to free market capitalism were forced to reach out to one another with a sense of urgency. They had to come together and do something to rehabilitate liberalism and combat the appeal of interventionism. In 1938, one of the first major attempts of a rehabilitation of this kind was attempted in Paris at a gathering called the Colloque Walter Lippmann. The event was a discussion of the book The Good Society by the American journalist Walter Lippmann and was organized by the French philosopher Louis Rougier. The participants of this conference included Hayek and Mises, along with a host of other German and French liberals. Most notably, they included Alexander Rousteau and Wilhelm Rapke, two German economists associated with the University of Freiburg and who were foundational thinkers of the school of ordo-liberalism, a tangential offshoot of neoliberalism which would later birth the social market economy that rejuvenated West Germany after World War II. It was at this gathering of concerned liberal thinkers that the term neoliberalism was first coined by Rousteau. However, far from being a monolithic consensus, there were plenty of divergences in thought about what this new liberalism ought to look like. Was freedom an end in itself, or merely a means? Is liberalism a rigorous application of economic laws, or merely an ideology? Does liberalism have to take into account the provision of social security or not? On these issues there was a clear divide. One side, headed by Rougier, Rousteau, and Rock, admitted the need to evolve past the shortcomings of laissez-faire liberalism which had led to the Great Depression. The other, advocated by Hayek and Mises, set out to define a liberalism that simply paired a free market liberal order with a strong state that reinforced competition. On this disagreement, Rousteau went straight to the point. It is undeniable that here, in our circle, two different points of view are represented. Those who do not find anything essential to be criticized or to change with traditional liberalism, and we, the others, who are seeking the responsibility for the decline of liberalism in liberalism itself, and consequently, are seeking the solution in a fundamental renewal of liberalism. Though Rousteau was courteous in public, in private, he told his colleague Ropke what he really thought of Hayek and Mises. They were relics and it was liberals of their stripe who had caused the crises of liberal capitalism of the 20th century. Nevertheless, there was a unified agenda produced by the Colloque Walter Lippmann that gives us one of the earliest rudimentary definitions of neoliberalism in history. The use of the price mechanism as the best way to obtain the maximal satisfaction of human expectations, the responsibility of the state for instituting a juridical framework adjusted to the order defined by the market, the possibility for the state to follow goals other than short-term expedience and to further them by levying taxes, and the acceptance of state intervention if it does not favor any particular group and seeks to act upon the causes of the economic difficulties. That might sound like a slightly more reasonable version of neoliberalism than you may have expected, but this conception of neoliberalism was not to last. As it turns out, the year 1938 was a terrible year to attempt to couple together an international movement across the European continent, because by the very next year, Nazi Germany would invade Poland and ignite the Second World War. After the start of the war, the participants of the Kolok Walter Lippmann were scattered across Europe, and the early neoliberal movement as a whole quickly went quiet. Individual activists such as Hayek and Mises were forced to keep up the fight in whatever capacity they could, even as they were forced out of their homes. Mises was forced to emigrate from his native Austria to New York, for Hayek, this meant relocating the campus of the London School of Economics directly into the layer of his ideological nemesis, Keynes and Cambridge. But the neoliberal movement wasn't out for good. Hayek used these war years in Cambridge to continue exploring political philosophy, refining his ideas on the division of knowledge, sharpening his critique of socialism, and then began drafting the book that would finally end his obscurity as an academic and a political thinker forever. That book was called The Road to Serfdom, and in the next episode, we'll follow Hayek's time at Cambridge, analyze the road to serfdom and its publication, and then document Hayek's organization of the Mont Pelerin Society, which finally gave modern neoliberalism its origin. 
But before any of this could happen, the Second World War would set the world on fire and set the stage for one of the greatest economic paradigm shifts in human history, the first deliberate re-embedding of markets into Keynesian liberalism.